My name is Dana Peck. On behalf of the City Club and its Science and Technology <coughs> Committee, I'd like to welcome you here this morning. Good turnout for our first meeting of the year, and I'm sure that our sponsors, who are made up of CH2M Hill, the Good Samaritan Hospital, Mentor Graphics Foundation, Precision Castports Corporation, the Intel Corporation, Fujitsu America, Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of Oregon, and Tektronix will be very happy to see that their, their money is contributing not only to an interesting topic, but to a good turnout. And uh, as, a, as a representative of the City Club, I'm, of course, obligated to say that there's membership cards at each of your places. That gets me off the hook on that one right off the bat. This is our first science breakfast of the year. We're very happy that it's able to have an international theme, and particularly uh, a Soviet international theme at this time in our mutual histories. We feel that uh, Dr. Orloff from the Oregon Graduate Center and his guests, Dr. Denisenkov and Garahiza, my apologies on the names, are uh, really taking us into what will be very profitable collaborative research in the future. You've got biographical sketches in your yellow pamphlets there, which I'll let you review on your own, since, as I said earlier, I, you can read faster than I can talk. And with that said, I'd like to introduce Dr. Orloff and his guests and just move into the breakfast. The sequence this morning, so you'll know, is Dr. Orloff will be introducing both the topic and his guests, uh, making a brief presentation, you know, give you a sense of the nature of their collaboration, and we'd like to move very quickly into questions as, uh, as they have their presentation out of the way. We think it's uh, an unusual opportunity to have some give and take, and that's the way we're going to try and handle it this morning. So please be, be thinking about things that you can be asking, because that's very much a part of our program today. Thanks again for coming, and thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, just by way of introduction, I'm a professor at the Oregon Graduate Center in the Department of Applied Physics. Our guests this morning, Dr. Denisenko and Dr. Gieber-Gisoff, both work at the Institute of Crystallography, which is uh, part of the Academy of Sciences, and they work in Moscow, of course, in the Soviet Union. Uh, Dr. Denisenko is a theoretical physicist, and he is also at this time the scientific secretary, which gives him a certain amount of administrative duties at the Institute. Dr. Gieber-Gisoff is the head of a laboratory there. <coughs> the uh, reason they're here is Dr. Gieber-Gisoff has made some visits to the United States in the past and has visited the Oregon Graduate Center three times in the past. In 1981, there was a scientific conference here, and at that time, he extended an, an invitation to me to visit his laboratory in the Soviet Union, which I did in 1982. And I visited again on an official basis last year, 1988, and at that time, we began trying to work out an arrangement whereby we could have a reciprocal visit. Uh, there has been an accord signed between our governments to promote joint scientific research, which we're hoping to take advantage of, and uh, we're going to see how that works out. In the meanwhile, uh, Dr. Denisenko and Dr. Gieber Gieshoff are both here on a scientific visit, and we are exchanging information, comparing notes, and uh, we'll probably try and, and set something up for the future. The uh, <coughs> work that they do involves crystallography, the study of crystals, the study of materials. The work which we do uh, involves development of methods and instrumentation which can be used for such studies. And so there's, there's obviously a, a mutual interest here. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that the, to finish the introduction, that uh, what I'm going to do is just very briefly say something about how scientific research is conducted here in the U.S., probably more from a, uh, a bureaucratic point of view rather than what you actually do in the laboratory which you probably find infinitely tedious and dull. But uh, the other part, how things are structured, might be of somewhat more interest. And then we will compare that with how this is done in the Soviet Union. Uh, Dr. Denisenko will tell you briefly about the structure of Soviet science. And you can contrast how things are done there with how things are done here. And at that point, I think it would be best to open it up for questioning or for questions. Uh, my remarks you can take any way you wish. Uh, Dr. Denisenko and Dr. Gieber-Gisoff, I would like to emphasize, are here on a scientific visit, not on a 
scientific bureaucratic visit, and therefore their remarks are <coughs> or should be construed in the context of being personal views, not official views. They are not official representatives of the Academy of Sciences, in other words, telling you how things work. They are scientists who work there telling you how things work. There's a big difference. Anyhow, uh, to get on with things, the way work is done in the United States is we have several classes of laboratories. There are universities. Universities, of course, are here to, to train students, but a great deal of research in the U.S. is done in university laboratories. You also have government laboratories, such as the National Bureau of Standards, where a lot of very fine scientific work is done. And you have industrial laboratories. Now, in most industrial labs, I think you would find applied work done. That is to say, people are going to take well-known, that is to say, published scientific results and find ways of applying these results to problems that face the individual company at a given time. <clears throat> the reason for this is that scientific research is both expensive and time-consuming. And therefore, to underwrite basic research takes a lot of resources and a lot of patience. This is fine in universities who are long on patience, if often short on resources, but sometimes these can be garnered from both the industrial sector and certainly from the government sector, from uh, institutions such as the National Science Foundation. Uh, only the largest companies are able to support any significant basic research. For example, IBM is currently, I suppose, the most famous example because their labs in Zurich have won the Nobel Prize in physics two years in a row. Uh, AT&T is another example with Bell Laboratories, which is a very famous laboratory. And both of these institutions are so big that they can turn people loose and tell them to study whatever they feel like studying and don't worry about results. You get what you get. If you don't get anything, it doesn't matter. This is the nature of research. So we have a triad here, a troika, if you will, <coughs> of government, private industry, and university. And this is the basis upon which research is built here in the United States, with the results of this research being exploited by primarily private industry uh, by using the literature, the open literature, in which the various results are published. So that's how things are done. The funding in industry, of course, comes from the industries themselves. The funding for universities comes mostly from government and, to some extent, uh, from private industrial resources usually in the form of research contracts. So now that you have an idea how things go here, I think I'd like to introduce Dr. Denisenko, who will make a few remarks on how this works in the Soviet Union, because it is a little bit different, and it is in a process of change. This is under the program that we know as Perestroika, and he will say a few words about how, this is effect how Perestroika is affecting the way science is done. And then I think at that point we open it for questions. George? First of all, I'd like to say that it's a great honor for me and my colleague to have a possibility to speak with you so early in the morning. <laughs> well, uh, I'd like to say well uh, some general uh, things about uh, the science in the Soviet Union. You see, in our country, uh, for example, the system of universities and uh, high technical schools are uh, most for the uh, for the study uh, for the study, and of course uh, there are some research works there, but not in. Uh, of course, it's only a little part of the activities. Uh, science in our country is uh, mostly in the Academy of Sciences, uh, in the institutes of Academy of Sciences, and in some institutes of uh, of industry. But as to fundamental research, they are mostly concerned with the Academy of Science. Uh, Academy of Science uh, was uh, established by Peter, the Peter the Great, if historically speaking. So we, it has a very long history. So nowadays, in Academy of Science, we have, let us say, uh, well, in general, more or less uh, 200 different institutes in Academy of Science of the USSR. But uh, in each, uh, in each uh, socialist republics of the Soviet Union, for example, Ukraine, Belarus, and so on, there are. Uh, also academy, for example, Academy of Science of the Ukrainian uh, Republic and so on. So, um, but exactly in the Academy of Science of the USSR, we have, let us say, approximately five, uh, 50,000 uh, scientific research workers. 
So Academy of Science, by its uh, the idea of it, it is uh, uh, fundamental research. Of course, nowadays, uh, if you look for for science in general, uh, if there are some, let us say, uh, possibility of applications, so uh, some connections between uh, institutes of Academy of Science of Industry is possible. But in generally. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, research work in academy in the institutes of academy of science are uh, in nature, let us say, a fundamental one. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, financial support of, uh, of this research work are uh, from budget. Uh, some, uh, of course, uh, some money comes uh, also from industry, but uh, the most part of it from the budget. Uh, strictly speaking, in the Academy of Science, we have, let us say, uh, so-called academician, full academicians, and also correspondent members. As usual, it is uh, they are prominent scientists. Uh, most of them are head of institutes and uh, head of laboratories and so on. Uh, approximately, we have uh, in uh, this system we have 50, uh, 500 full academicians and. Uh, 2,000 uh, correspondent members. It's, uh, I'm speaking only now about Academy of Science of the uh, USSR, not about Academy of Sciences of also the uh, Socialist Republics in the Soviet Union. There, there are also academicians and correspondent members uh, of uh, those academies. Uh, but uh, uh, those academies are more concerned with the problems of uh, those republics as to Academy of Science are concerned with the uh, problems of the Soviet Union, let us say, in general, of science. So, uh, you know, as I, I give as a present, for example, uh, among academicians, uh, we can see uh, such, me uh, uh, such persons as Basov and Prokhorov, who are very well known for laser, uh, laser, uh, uh, well, Discovery of laser and so on, they are Nobel Prize winner. Together with towns from the United States. So, uh, and uh, taking into account that these uh, talks, uh, our talk here is more or less concerned, uh, mostly concerned not only with science, but uh, the present situation in science. Uh, taking into account that in our country there is a very uh, well-known throughout the world process of perestroika. So I'd like to say that uh, the main idea, as in all uh, branches of industry, in whole life of our country, is to intensify, intensify, uh, uh, let us say, life in all, uh, well, its appearances. For example, uh, in science, it's uh, to intensify scientific research. It's possible, uh, and it is now done by different ways. For example, if previously the most part of, uh, let us say, budget was fixed for the institutes of Academy of Science and the Academy of Science as a whole, nowadays it's necessary to participate in different projects. Well, for example, the first, uh, and uh, it seems to me more uh, interesting example, was uh, the project about high uh, temperature superconductivity. Of course, uh, it seems to me that all, all people throughout the world heard about this, uh, this very f uh, interesting phenomena, and uh, maybe once it will be uh, very, how say, it will has, it will have el many applications. So uh, this project was, uh, let us say, the idea of the project was uh, a governmental one to investigate such a phenomena, uh, phenomenon. But uh, nevertheless, uh, all the institutes and uh, even, let us say, uh, personal uh, scientific research worker uh, in persons, not only as institutions, they have a possibility to uh, enter to this project, obtain the money, and so on. And uh, it seems to me this uh, kind of uh, organization of uh, obtaining uh, support is more or less looks like as in your country from uh, uh, Thanks. Uh, yes, that's right. So, and more that uh, nowadays, 
We have different kind of possibility to organize scientific research work and uh, obtain projects, uh, obtain uh, support and so on uh, by different uh, ways, but maybe it will be some questions. So uh, my colleague, uh, who are a member, uh, the chief of our lab, lab, he will tell you more, more exactly how to obtain money in such a way. So, um, also, uh, nowadays, uh, let us say, a personal possibility of scientific research worker are, uh, uh, how to say, more interesting, personally. Uh, this person can uh, obtain the, let's say, achievement and his position and so on in different ways. Previously, this system was more or less uh, fixed, uh, not so uh, flexible as nowadays. Uh, then, uh, nowadays, for example, if previously, as usual, uh, the chief of laboratory and uh, other person in science was uh, put on this place, let us say, by uh, official statement, but nowadays it's necessary to go through such a uh, process as election. For example, uh, the director of the institute nowadays, even uh, he, for example, uh, he or she is, uh, let us say, academician, for academician, but nevertheless, he has to come to the process of election in the institute. Uh, the same for the uh, chief of laboratories and, uh, well. So, of course, it's only, let us say, first steps, but nevertheless, uh, the, uh, uh, the scientific life uh, in our country now is, uh, uh, I can say, uh, uh, this, uh, I have a possibility to see it exactly. It is more vivid than previously. So we hope that uh, all these uh, all these steps will lead to the uh, to to make uh, uh, the development of science in our country uh, more extensive and so on. I suppose in science it's a, a rule that the most effective means of communication is by questions and answers rather than by making speeches. Uh, I've often seen that somebody can give a long talk at a scientific meeting which is of greater or lesser interest and then a few penetrating questions afterwards which either shows that he's full of hot air or not full of hot air is, is much more valuable than the talk. Uh, be that as it may, we'd like to throw things open now for general questions from the audience to both Dr. Denisenko and to Dr. Gibragizov, who are going to have to come up here. <coughs> and uh, I've been asked to repeat questions for the purposes of, of the tape here, which I, I guess is being made for didactic purposes, I'm not sure. And uh, <coughs> so. I don't know if there should be a moderator other than myself or not. Maybe just throw the questions up, I'll repeat them, and uh, either Dr. Gibragizov or Dr. Denisenko will provide answers, or maybe both. Yes? It seemed to me that uh, the uh, Soviet uh, categories were categorized fields rather finely. Well, the question for the tape was, <coughs> if something really new and novel comes along, such as high temperature superconductivity, how is this administratively handled by the Academy of Sciences? Is a new academy created, and, or a new institute created, I should say? Or if not, then how do the existing institutes go about deciding how this new phenomenon should be studied? I think we've got some good answers to that. Uh, see, uh, 
Of course, when uh, uh, each institute, of course, has uh, more or less uh, its own field of investigations, it's understandable because to begin something to investigate this for many years. But when some new phenomena appears, for example, uh, this high temperature superconductivity, uh, at first moment uh, throughout the world was, let us say, uh, a personal interest for this uh, for this phenomena. Uh, in each laboratory throughout the world, and also in our country, in our institute exactly, uh, people began to to look. It's very interesting phenomena. What to do with it? And began to make some, let us say, preliminary studies in their labs. After that, it was understood that uh, to participate in such phenomena, uh, in investigations of such phenomenon, it's necessary, I would say, to make more, uh, uh, to, uh, it's necessary more forces, scientific forces, you see. And uh, the question was discussed uh, in the board, for example, in our institute exactly, and uh, taking into account that these uh, uh, studies are very interesting and so on, and uh, some uh, people in the institutes uh, gave a lot of attention to this phenomena. Uh, it was decided that they uh, will move to this field, exactly. And uh, uh, moreover, after that it was discussed in which uh, branch of this uh, research our institute was, uh, can work also. Uh, our institute, for example, exactly is a very uh, strong, let us say, in studies of structure of crystals, and as well as growing crystals. So it was decided that uh, we are go, uh, we are go into investigations of structure of these superconducting materials, uh, uh, crystalline structure, and uh, uh, to go into the attempts to grow uh, more or less big monocrystals, single crystals of superconductors. And in this field, we obtained, let us say, more or less interesting results. And when uh, this project uh, on the, let us say, on the broad level appeared about superconductivity studies, so uh, we have a possibility, the scientists in our institute, to give uh, some, project, uh, some projects and obtain uh, financial support. So we see uh, this system works in such a way that uh, Previously, it is only, let us, let us say, an idea of a uh, single person, maybe maybe a group of scientists. After that, uh, some kind of discussions on the so-called scientific council in the institute uh, with the uh, leadership and so on. But uh, of course, uh, when uh, such a very uh, interesting phenomena, phenomena appear, appeared, uh, sometimes new institutes are uh, brought into life in the system academy. It's also possible. Yeah, well, it's done in, in basically the same way. If some interesting new phenomena comes along, such as the high TCs, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was, how is it done in the United States? And um, it's done basically the same way. If a new phenomena is found, how do we handle it here in our research institutions? In an academic area, it's fairly easy for a researcher to start an investigation on a small level and to carry it out on a more extensive level it's necessary to obtain funding. So typically you would make an application someplace like the National Science Foundation and say this is an interesting area, this is why it's interesting, this is what's been done, this is what I propose to do. And if you have a good enough proposal, you'll gain funding. In an industrial laboratory, in many of them, I suppose it would be necessary to show the relevance of this new study to the basic mission of the laboratory. But in a place like, say, Bell Labs, or say the uh, IBM research institutions, it would be done, I think, very much like in the Academy of Sciences. You would have a new phenomenon discovered. Several people there very likely would have an interest in this particular field of study, and they would begin investigating it on their own. If it looked like it would be worthwhile following up, they would then take it to their managers, and there would be a discussion there as to what sort of a budget should be allocated 
to study this phenomenon. And if it looked like it was worthwhile and interesting enough to study, then the managers in the research area would propose a budget to their management and obtain funds to support the purchase of equipment, materials, and allocation of people to this new study. So probably the closest connection or the, the closest analogy would be between some place like Bell Laboratories or the, the IBM Watson Research Laboratories back east and the Academy of Sciences. In the government laboratories, I'm not sure. Probably it would run pretty much the same way. The biggest difference, I think, would be between universities here in America and the Academy of Sciences because the method of obtaining funds is quite different. Yes. <coughs> We have two questions. The first one related to environment, <coughs> and specifically was, uh, is the government of the Soviet Union uh, interacting with governments of other countries uh, on problems of international concern, such as global warming? And the second question, well, first, uh, Dr. Giefer Gisov has made several trips to the United States. Uh, this is the first trip on the part of Dr. Denisenko. The question uh, is, presumably, for both people, are you going to be visiting other scientific institutions? Uh, it's my first uh, coming to the United States. Uh, I will have a possibility uh, to visit. Yesterday will be the Clark College, yes. And uh, um, this Monday will be also in uh, state universities, uh, Oregon State University. And uh, Monday, uh, the next Tuesday, I will be in Argonne National <coughs> Laboratory with uh, Dr. Carnell. <coughs> who is in optics, uh, well, we know uh, each other well. So, and uh, as to this question about the participation in these uh, general um, investigations of general, uh, let us say, phenomena in the world, for example, this warming and so on, it seems to me that is done, uh, it is done. Of course, I'm not, how to say, I only uh, know only uh, in general uh, about this, but it seems to me that uh, our country uh, and our science participates, participates in this, uh, uh, for example, through the conferences, through some uh, projects maybe in UNESCO, I don't know. But nevertheless, of course, uh, such problems cannot be possible to decide in one country only. So, About visits, I am going, uh, in addition to the visit to the Oregon State University at Corvallis, also to visit the University of Pennsylvania at Philadelphia uh, for one day. And uh, as for, uh, I would like to make some addition to talk of my colleague about organization of the science in Soviet Union. Some, some new phenomena related to perestroika. Uh, before, for example, we had some budget for the institute, but we have some budget for laboratory as part of the institute, and uh, this budget uh, divided for, exa for example, for fa salary, for equipment, for materials, and these parts were approximately fixed so it, especially part relating to salary and the uh, uh, scopes were rather narrow for salary of people. Uh, some sequences of the perestroika is the first. Now we have more broad scopes for rising of salary of people depending on their activity. Uh, more uh, stages for scientists, beginning from uh, young scientists up to some senior scientists and so on. And we have now uh, about, for example, five stages 
for salary of people depending on their activity and difference between low and top is about three times. Second, uh, beginning from this year, in addition to the project kind of uh, uh, by our distribution of our budget, this means that budget from government is given for development of some more important fields of investigation, mainly for fundamental research. In addition, we have some part of the budget for some uh, pure theoretical, pure fundamental research, it is in addition to some projects. Second, uh, now we can have more possibility to have funds from any contracts with industry or with other institutes of academy of science or with university too, especially uh, mainly from industry. For example, if there is some good result in, in the fundamental research, uh, and if industry is interested in this, it's possible to have some contract with the, with the industry, and some part of the money could, can be devoted for salary. And so in this respect, now we have not upper limit for salary, th theoretically, at least theoretically. Of course, money from industry are also <coughs> limited from industry, from industry side. But in principle, it's possible to raise salary uh, theoretically without any limit. It's a very important point. And in addition, now, during, for example, last half of a year and in the future, uh, there is some new kind of organization of science, of science. For example, we can organize special centers with Economical independent, which is economically <coughs> independent on, on institute. This means that this is this should uh, have money from contract pure only from from contract with industry. And what is important probably is it is different from your country that because our science is on government basis in general in in industry or in academy of sciences. So it is possible to, if we have, for example, money from contracts with industry, and in scope of the contract, we should decide several points of, of, of any problems, we can organize some special groups on, on some temporary basis and to attract for participants in these groups people from different different institutes, different university, even from industry too, from research institutes in, in industry, to decide any problem and to have some special money from this contract to pay for these people. But the people should work outside of working day, working time. So in addition to they work in their own institute or laboratory, they can have possibility to work especially for this contract and uh, the center, which is organizer of this work, of this study, should ask from administration of that any any laboratory possibility to use this person for this job, and to uh, to use the equipment of this uh, of this uh, institutes other institutes, and also some money for this for um, what I don't know what's amortization for this, to use this equipment. It should be also transferred to this institute officially, in addition to many to money for these people who uh, participate in this research. So this is a good uh, basis for uh, uh, encouraging of people to uh, uh, to work in uh, for some innovations. What is very very important. What I want to do to, to say about some kind of new organization in our science. <clears throat> concerned the big problem in the United States is <clears throat> money from industry comes into the, either the government institutes or the universities and we have an, an ongoing problem of uh, undue influence, uh, corruption, if you like, uh, that the university facilities say end up being used only for industry although they're only paying a little bit. 
industry pays in a little bit, but since it's loose money, it's able to influence people to work more on the industry projects than it should. There's a whole group of problems that maybe. To, to repeat the question, this gets into a, a big issue, and the question is, if industry begins f sending money, say, to university laboratories to support research, does this have an undue influence? In other words, if industry sends money in which corresponds to 10 percent of the total budget, say, of research or for research at an institution, does it have an undue influence in the sense that more than 10 percent of the work that's being done is being done for industry. And would this happen in the Soviet Union? This is a somewhat subtle and complicated question. I, I will try to answer you. Uh, for example, in our institute, our director is interested that people will uh, work for science uh, for salary which is from the institute. Certainly he is concerned about, uh, the, uh, concerned that uh, <coughs> people uh, where could be work on this area strictly on the uh, area of the institute, certainly. However, in time to time we have some kind of, of attestation of people. So if they will work on, uh, not on the topic of the institute during necessary time. In any time, it will be clear. For example, there will be no publication, there will be no results for, in the field of the institute. So uh, the people could lost could uh, could uh, lost uh, lose his his position. So of course, it is it is point of con 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 of concerning. Uh, yes, concerning, yes, correct. A uh, point of concern, but I think it is uh, not so strict a limitation for uh, any uh, activity, uh, ad additional extra, extra job and extra money. In addition, uh, what is important, of course, uh, when uh, there is uh, some ch chance to work on this direction, uh, this topic of of job. As a rule, is correct is uh, connected with its main activity in this field. So, it will be also for in favor of any development of, of his ba his principal job. I'd like to add a, a word. I, I said it was a subtle problem, and it, there's there's more to this than than immediately meets the eye. If you're working in university and you get a research contract from industry, which amounts to 10% of your funding, say. It's difficult to keep that research just to 10%. The reason is, if you start working on a project, you have to have technical support. You may have to buy equipment. Uh, there's a limit to how much of this you can get. If you had 10 different projects adding up to 100% of what you were doing, it would probably be impossible to shift back and forth between 10 different projects. When you start getting research support at the beginning of your career, it begins to direct where you're going to do the work, the direction that you're going. And you can't deviate too much from that. So you may start out with some modest amount of industry support to study a particular subject, but it's difficult to range over a wide variety of subjects. Once you get started, this more or less determines the direction that your research is going to go, simply because you can't do everything. So in that sense, a little bit of funding, especially at the outset, may have a significant effect on your overall research program. But normally what you would do is having started in a particular area, you would try you would then try and attract funds from other support centers to keep going in the same area. So it's it's not quite as as black and white as it might seem. You might start studying high temperature superconductors because industry gives you a little bit of money to go in that direction. By the time you get a laboratory set up to study high temperature superconductors, you're going to want to keep going in that area. And therefore, maybe 90% of your funds comes from National Science Foundation thereafter. But is this undue influence on the part of industry? It's not simple. Yes. Uh, how much 
the contact is there between Soviet and American scientists, and how much cooperative research is there, and how much is that likely to dramatically change over the next five years? The question is, how much contact is there between Soviet and American scientists, and how much cooperative research is there between them, and is li this likely to change or presumably to increase in the future? I think you can answer that. I can say some uh, on, the, on the Academy of Sciences. Uh, there is, uh, for many years, uh, uh, some agreement about uh, uh, exchange. There is uh, some uh, long-term exchange program between Academy of Sciences and National Academy of, Academy of Sciences of the United States. And scopes of the collaboration, unfortunately, was before not too broad. I don't, I don't know exactly, but probably about 20 to 50 uh, scientists per year on all branches of, of, of science uh, visited the United States for periods from one month or three months or six months and so on. Uh, this mainly is this problem of money in your country, for example, if. Sometimes we have invitation for, for collaboration in expense, not acad a National Academy of Science, but from any universities or any other laboratories. For example, our visit here is in an uh, open to funds from Oregon Graduate Center. And I also, I don't know exactly the figure, but I sh think that it is approximately the same level as uh, uh, yes. any collaboration via this official agreement between Academy of Sciences. But we hope that uh, our collaboration will be expanded more and more in the nearest time owing to this new situation in our relation between our countries. And uh, uh, this is, here is some, some uh, example of this uh, new situation that uh, quite recently there were some uh, <coughs> official uh, contract, official agreement between uh, our minister, minister of International Affairs, Mr. Shevardnadze, and your former uh, the secretary, the part, uh, state secretary, George Schultz, about for me, uh, organization of some, uh, some uh, joint ventures on cooperative basis. And I think it will be also give uh, some uh, kind of good contribution to, to collaboration between scientists of our, of our countries. Yes. Um, I have a general question in regards to how your students have shared with us how you encourage the Well, the question, I think, basically is <clears throat> uh, what method is used in the Soviet Union to encourage people to go into the sciences starting at the high school level? Uh, uh, I'd like to say that uh, uh, this po uh, some problem exists, existed in our country. You see, a little bit uh, uh, the system of Academy of Science, we don't teach uh, uh, in the universities and so on. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, to obtain the possibility to uh, to take people from the uh, universities after finishing them for scientific work is necessary to make some kind of, pub uh, let's say, publicity of our studies and so on. So we, uh, we have to uh, go to the universities and so on to make some uh, kind of uh, talk about our activities and so on. But uh, nowadays, uh, <coughs> this process, uh, a new process began. Uh, some of our scientists have uh, uh, a possibility to study, uh, not to study, to, to deliver lectures uh, on, uh, uh, let us say, a stable basis in the universities, and so uh, have a possibility to, to see uh, young people who are interested, uh, who are uh, in, 
who have uh, interested in science. So uh, each year uh, some new uh, uh, people from the uh, universities uh, or higher technical schools are coming to the institute for, uh, we have, let us say, in our institute we have so-called postgraduate uh, system. So they are coming for, uh, uh, to prepare their PhD degree, let us say, comparing with the United States. So our system here is more like looks, for example, as in uh, uh, Oregon uh, Graduate Center, but only on the second level, on the level of the PhD degree, not of Master of Science. Uh, so this is one of the way uh, how we can obtain new uh, research uh, workers, young research workers. Uh, well, uh, at the first moment, they have uh, and the money for the let us say for their living and so on uh, is coming from the also from the budget. They obtained so-called uh, in, in Russian stipendia, uh, pension, let us say here. So, and uh, if for example they are um, they are not Moscovites, they are from other uh, towns. They lived in a special uh, hostel. The dormitory for the postgraduates. I'd like to say that they, uh, it's necessary to pay, but it's uh, very, very little money for to pay to stay in this uh, uh, dormitory. You see, so they obtain money for their living. Of course, uh, maybe uh, it's not for young people. I interest also not only in science, but uh, to look uh, to go to theaters and so on. And uh, but uh, uh, this. Uh, amount of money is more or less, uh, well, more and more uh, uh, high from year to year. So it's uh, the general well, uh, question seems to me. So uh, in such a way we obtained, uh, we have a possibility to obtain new uh, research workers. Uh, also, of course, uh, some of them maybe are not uh, the good research workers. So. Uh, we have such a system that during the first two years they are uh, so-called uh, young research workers, so they have a possibility to show what they can do. And after that, maybe uh, uh, if they are not good for science, they uh, they go themselves to another branch of activities, or maybe there's some kind of examination after this. Uh, well, about the system of PhD degree, I said that we have such a uh, system in our uh, institutes of Academy of Science. But of course, uh, for my own opinion, I previously have a possibility to work at the university. Um, it seems to me that some kind of uh, split between the system of Academy of Science and university uh, exists. And uh, nowadays, uh, such a splitting I hope that uh, some process of, let us say, to make this split narrow, narrow, and uh, that no split at all uh, is going now. So I hope that after that it will be more, uh, more possibility to, to obtain the good uh, research workers for the Academy of Science. It's my own opinion. Yes. <laughs> could, could you contact the Uh, well, yeah, the, the question sounded like it was going to be a different question. Uh, we contrast what goes on in the United States with what goes on in the Soviet Union with regard to a, a famous dictum, publish or perish. Uh, for the benefit of my guests here, let me explain that in many academic institutions, it is necessary to constantly publish presumably publish something worthwhile in order to maintain <laughs> one's position. Uh, this is an interesting question because if you look in the sciences, you find that there are a large number of scientists engaged in or uh, are employed by universities and industry. But the lifetime number of publications, up through however old somebody is, in the sciences in the United States only averages about oh, somewhere between five and ten which is a very small number of publications. 
Presumably that means that the people who are in the academic area are mostly doing teaching. The uh, people who are really actively engaged, engaged in research are publishing two or three papers a year. So after 20 years in the field, they got 40 or 50 publications or even more, which is typical for a, a really, you know, a research scientist who's really doing research. But to get back to the question, there was this issue of publish or perish. If you don't publish, you lose your job. Is there anything like that in the Soviet Union? Uh, you see, as I, I said previously, we have some kind of, um, not examination, but uh, each uh, five years, scientific research worker has to show what uh, he, he done uh, during these five years. And uh, moreover, the whole system of, uh, of the science is if you don't publish nothing, uh, it, it means that you are doing nothing. What for? To do that? So. <laughs> and moreover, this is the question of, let us say, and uh, honor to be published in uh, the most prominent, uh, well, uh, scientific magazines. In our country, we have Academy of Science itself has a system of uh, scientific uh, magazines. And uh, the most of them uh, are translated into English. And uh, for example, in the uh, Oregon Graduate Center in the uh, library, I saw some of them. This is solid state physics, for example. Uh, uh, the Soviet uh, uh, magazine uh, crystallography, crystallography and so, semiconductors and optics and so on. So. Uh, most of them are translated. We even obtained money for this. You see, it's very interesting. <laughs> Not from the Soviet Union, but it's uh, that it is published in the United States. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. So, uh, so for scientific research worker, it's uh, uh, well, it's uh, of course uh, he he uh, or she, sorry, did work and. Uh, it's necessary to show it on the conferences, in the magazines, and so on. It's some kind of, it's, it seems really understandable. No. 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 The question is, in, in industry, frequently one is not able to publish. Uh, this would be because uh, the research is often proprietary. It has certain commercial value, and therefore you don't want to talk about it for some period of time. Is there anything comparable to this in the Soviet Union? And if so, how is the decision made, and who makes the decision as to whether or not work should be published? Uh, as I said previously, uh, as to uh, well, about Academy of Science, you see, uh, the researchers, the research work in the Academy of Science is, uh, by its nature, a fundamental one. For example, if it is, for example, about superconductivity, what this phenomena means, you see, what is the, the idea of, re of the research? Of course, at the end, uh, uh, we hope that, and uh, throughout the world, uh, such hope exists that this research goes into industry, and uh, so it will be more cheaper to uh, transform energy and so on to from one town to give it from one town to another and so on. So, but uh, so uh, oh, I'd like to say that uh, uh, all, for example, all scientific work which is done in the Academy of Science uh, is published. You see, in these magazines. Uh, as to industry, it seems to me such a system exists throughout the world. If uh, these, uh, if uh, some research has let us say technological value and so on. Uh, the system of uh, patents and so, uh, so on exists throughout the world. Uh, in our country, we have our own system. But if we uh, some such uh, research is interesting throughout the world, then uh, it's possible to obtain patent uh, in uh, such a such country. For example, our institute has uh, uh, some patents also in the United States. So uh, this is uh, some kind of defending of the results, which has, uh, which have uh, industrial value. So this question is, uh, how to say, of course, uh, maybe some works are interesting from this point of view, and they have to be defended, let us say. 
But if you are speaking about fundamental research, of course they are published uh, without any restrictions and so on. And these magazines which are translated, which uh, are translated and so on. I would like to add that if there some scientific work is made under some contract with industry, in this case, there is in the contract a special point which uh, indicates that uh, any results obtained during this work sh uh, uh, could be published only uh, by consensus between uh, industry as uh, uh, or which ordered this work and and this laboratory. So, is there a time limit on that, or is it? Is a restriction only for six months or three years? No, 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 no limit. For, for example, if, for example, any contract is for one year, and during this research work, some results could be of scientific interest, but some of them would be, for example, of te technological interest. So in the end of the contract, or during the contract, or just after finishing this contract, it is decided, for, uh, is it, possible to publish this result or not from the point of any of any technological point of view. I'd like to add that there's a, a comparable situation here in the United States. For example, at the Oregon Graduate Center, about one third of our research work is supported by industry, which is a very high level, higher I think than any other university in the, in the United States. And from time to time, uh, an industrial contract will be made which specifies the results are not to be published for some period of time. But since a university in the United States is supposed to be doing work for the public, there is a limit which is about 10 percent on the amount of work that cannot be published. So it's a very comparable situation. Yes? Despite the new openness and the exchange programs, Uh, the question <coughs> relates to restrictions on the part of government to flow of information. And I think this gets back to what uh, Dr. Gieber Gisoff said, <coughs> and also Dr. Denisenko, I guess. If you're doing fundamental research, uh, there are no barriers. If you are doing technological research, by which I would mean something that could have <coughs> commercial value, if it's not uh, sent out abroad or if it's kept secret or military value, then there are restrictions on this. So from, I'll, I'll let them speak to the, to the Soviet side, from the American side, if you're doing fundamental research, it's invariably published in the open literature and it's available to anybody anywhere in the world who wants to read it. If you were doing research which has technological value, which would probably be a contract for some specific purpose, maybe developing some new device for industry, then there may indeed be barriers on this. And if you were doing something which is perceived by the government to have military value, which nowadays means anything, <laughs> which is rather stupid, but anyhow, that's the way it is, then the government may indeed try and put restrictions on this. That's from the American side. Maybe you would like to comment on the, on the other side. It seems to me it's better to give uh, an example uh, of such a kind. For example, uh, in the 60s, as you know, uh, a new uh, phenomenon, so this so-called laser, laser appeared, yes, throughout the world. So, as well in the, in the United States, in the Soviet Union, and so on. And the, uh, at first, it was the question of how to uh, obtain, let us say, uh, crystals for, for the ruby crystals of good size and big size and uh, good quality for such, for such a, uh, a device as laser. And uh, exactly our institute in the Soviet Union was uh, the first one who developed such a process of growing big ruby crystals of such a size, let's say. It's rods of such a length and such diameter, let us say. So, of course, after that, uh, uh, 
it's impossible to grow these crystals in broad, uh, well, as in in, uh, in industry. You see, in the uh, ordinary institute, this uh, institute, uh, we are scientific institute. So this process was, uh, how to say, we we gave it to the industry and so on, but uh, well, transferred to the industry. So uh, and. Uh, and now the question will begin. For example, uh, the application of this laser, as you know, uh, for example, in the medicine and uh, in communications, and uh, let's say, for example, here is, uh, and uh, well, for example, some uh, uh, communications is possible for, let us say, for the ordinary purposes, for males and so on, but it's also possible for some military applications. But you see, so each uh, results can be used in the so, but it is not in the uh, Academy of Science uh, for the fundamental research. Of course, when uh, some applications will begin, it's uh, another question. So it's, uh, it seems to me it's more or less an answer. We are, we are going from the fundamental research to the applications, and the applications can be very wide, very different, yes, but it's stage. Of course, some of them are uh, maybe even military purposes, lasers also can be used. Yes. Yes. Uh, one question. I think most of the people are familiar with the uh, trouble that Sakharov got into for, for political things, even though it's a very uh, well recognized uh, expedition. With the advent of the changes in the Soviet Union, is that freeing up a little bit, allowing people to have uh, more diverse political opinions and not affecting their, their scientific career? And, and a second one, a little bit technology, we were talking about the uh, high temperature. And Dr. Danisenko says that they're growing crystals to be superconductors versus uh, composite technology. What kind of luck do we have on that? Okay. Uh, the first question could perhaps be paraphrased as what is the effect of glasnost in the Soviet Union? The second question is uh, it's generally thought that the new high temperature superconductors are composite materials. What success uh, are you having in your laboratories in making these in a crystalline form? So I will begin from the second one question, so it's easy. Uh, as to the crystals, throughout the world uh, the results are more or less the same. It's possible to grow single crystals, but they are very small in size. Very small, let us say maybe uh, some uh, two or three millimeters in length or more or less and very thick, so it's the same. But uh, this question is interesting from the point of view of investigation structure of these materials. For example, if you have these ceramics, in it, it there are different, uh, well, different phases. For example, also non-superconductivity phase and uh, superconduct superconductive phase. But if you have a more, uh, single crystal, it's uh, superconductive or not. So it's possible more easily investigate this phenomena. Nowadays, uh, nobody uh, grows a crystal of big size. It's a pity, of course, but nevertheless, it, uh, this is uh, more or less the same in the Soviet Union and the United States and in each country. As to the glasses, uh, I'd like to say that, uh, as previously I spoke, I've spoken about it, this. This is the question of uh, uh, more broad discussions of uh, uh, plans of to which way to go, for example. Then this is the question of the uh, system of election uh, of, uh, let, us say, uh, let us say, scientific authorities on different levels, from the director of the institute and to the chief of laboratory. Then also it's more broad discussions of uh, such problems, for example, as, uh, you know, this environment, uh, problems of environment. Uh, for example, this uh, Lake Baikal and uh, uh, in our country, maybe you heard about it, this. This uh, then uh, the turning of uh, uh, no North Pole uh, rivers to the uh, river Volga, maybe you heard about this project. So uh, nowadays it's more broad discussions of all questions of scientific uh, uh, meaning and uh, in uh, the system of Academy of Science and the system of universities and so on. 
Probably I would like to, I will probably I will add uh, relating to Sakharov. And uh, I know only, in, I, I'm not familiar with him, and I know only from, from our uh, newspapers and, and from talks in the Academy of Sciences. Uh, you, uh, probably you know that this year, uh, I think in June, should be elections for our subprime Soviet, similar to your Congress. And <clears throat> Academy of Sciences is one of the public organization <clears throat> which has possibility to uh, propose some candidates. And, uh, and Academy of Sciences uh, proposed about 20, can about 20 candidates. And Sakhra was discussed as one of the major uh, candidates for the elections. However, on some probably occasional reasons, because elections uh, due to uh, due to mm, Ustav, Ustav means some mm, regulation of Academy of Sciences. Elections, uh, any any important dis decision, are. Uh, Adopted not by all people in the Academy of Science, by, but by members of the Academy of Science. This means academician or uh, mem corresponding members of the Academy of, Academy of Sciences. It is rather <coughs> narrow basis, and academician Sakharov was uh, pro proposed by many discussed uh, in in general, not only academia, academician of Sakharov, any candidates for deputy were discussed on all institutes of Academy of Sciences. And different institutes proposed any people, for, for example, many, many people, about probably 150 persons for, for elections. But a uh, uh, final decision was made by our Academy of Sciences of Presidium, or this is um, uh, only members of the Academy. And occasionally it was not proposed for Deputy. However, after that, it was proposed by uh, some other public uh, meeting, and now he is the uh, candidate for deputy in, uh, in the Academy uh, in, the, in the Supreme Soviet. Not only Sakharov, but many other, so several other famous scientists, academicians, and so on, were not elected in this preliminary stage. But probably it was some occasional reasons and. Most famous from them after that were uh, proposed by public, uh, pub any other other public meetings. So they are now candidate for deputy, for as a, for example as member of, of Congress and so on. We've uh, pretty much reached the close of our session. If we can have one more question, perhaps. It's a very enthusiastic looking question. Uh, can you comment on Jump. the extent the of opportunity for technology transfer by a scientist in taking advantage, personal advantage in an in a economic sense of uh, their own discoveries by commercialization and uh, taking the, the, the scientific idea outside of the Academy of Science? Uh, the question is, is it feasible in the Soviet Union if a scientist makes some discovery that can have great commercial value for him to profit by it personally. Uh, Dana, we had a, also a question from one of our high school students over here. I think we should give time for that as well uh, after this question is answered. So the question was... Uh, so, uh, formerly it, it was... Uh, so, for example, if any uh, person has some good idea it can patent it in the Soviet Union, or, uh, but uh, now this possibility is far more broad uh, to have patent not only in Soviet Union but also outside. But it's necessary to pay some money for patent in, in outside. And if there will be any interested organization or institute to help this person to to make patent, it, it, it is possible now. And the discussion is new uh, law for uh, inventors, for inventions in Soviet Union. And there is different point of view, and discussion is open. This is issue, this is project of this law is uh, open for discussion in newspapers, and many different point of view now are 
in, in, this, in this respect, but in general, it is possible. Before, for example, if uh, any person had some patent in, inside, inside Soviet Union, for example, in, uh, this, this is not patent, it was named in past uh, some certificate, some certificate. He could obtain uh, some um, amount of money depending on effectivity of the result mm -hmm. when it is applied in industry. And but at that, that time, uh, in form, formally, there was some limit for the amounts. For example, 20,000 20, of rubles. This means about 30,000 of dollars. But now there is no limit. It depends on, on effectivity, independently on, on, on uh, so it, it depends now on more directly of, uh, on, on its effectivity. Maybe we end with a question from a student over here. Um, understanding that your research is limited in your country with the uh, cooperation or correspondence of American universities or other countries, can we expand your research? Oh, well, I guess the question is that there's a, a limitation at present on the amount of cooperation between Soviet science and, and American universities, or, or there's a, a present limit. Will this be expanded? Is that, that what your question was? With the cooperation of other countries or us? Yes. Do you, do you expect countries. to see an increasing cooperation between uh, Soviet mm -hmm. research and universities in, in the United States and other countries? Dr. Denisenko told that main research, academic science is only, only for research, but universities is mainly for education and partly for research. And we have special ministry of education uh, absolutely independent on, on academic science and sciences and uh, this ministry has its own program for collaboration between universities so uh, we don't know I, I we cannot give uh, any more information about this but I think that due to the general situation this collaboration will be more and more uh, broad